Uh, welcome to the podcast, guys. This is episode 12. Uh, this is round three of trying to get this recorded today. Uh, so I apologize to our guest very, very much. I'm sorry. Um, this is episode 12 interview with Shane and Garrity of SkinHorse.com. I am your host. Hello. <laughs> yes, yes, here's Shane and Um <laughs> I am your host, Melanie, from uh, steamandnonsense.tumblr.com, and my co-host today is Dave Barrick of girlpowercomic.com. Hola. Okay, this is the third try, <laughs> because recording software does not like me today. And, all right, so, uh, Shannon, let's give a little background. So, you got into comics at a young age, and just kept... <laughs> Going with them? Probably, yeah, probably the same age as everyone else. I mean, I just never stopped being into comics. You know, obviously I grew up reading comic strips and comic books like everybody, and I really got uh, heavily into comic books in high school. Um, initially through Sandman, which was one of the main gateway drugs for nerdy girls of my particular generation. And uh, from there I got into, you know, indie comics and other things, and in college I discovered uh, some friends introduced me to web comics, and I was like, hey, I can do that. So I, you know, um, immediately after graduating from college, I moved out to California, where I still am, uh, for a job, and I set up a very primitive website uh, for my first comic, Nerbonic. That was in 2000. So I'm one of the, yeah, I've been doing this since 2000, so I'm one of the old timers at this point. I did Nerbonic for six years. It was a daily comic. And then um, I started doing Skin Horse, which I do as a collaboration with uh, my co-writer, Jeffrey Wells. And uh, we've been doing that for about five years now. It's just, I can't it's been that long, actually. We just put out the fourth collection of Skin Horse books. So I've got that. And then, like, um, I've been doing this weekly comic called Monster of the Week, where every week I recap an episode of The X-Files, because that briefly seemed like a good idea. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now in terms of my own comics. Mm, uh, very nice. you know, sort of immersing comics 24-7. So are you mainly a traditional artist, or are you, are you digital, or kind of a combination of the two? Or? I'm super traditional. Uh, everything I draw, I just draw by hand, and then uh, I only use Photoshop to clean things up and... Um, Mostly, and color, if I'm doing the coloring, also, we have a, we actually have a colorist on Skin Horse now, which is very exciting. Um, Pacha Diaz is doing our color. Uh, but no, I just draw everything by hand and scan it in. The most obsessive thing I do with the with Photoshop is, like, straightening out my lettering to make it neater, because I'm very worried about my lettering. But mostly, what you see on the screen is what I'm actually drawing. I'm pretty old-fashioned. Do you sell any of your art? Like, the leftovers? You bet I do. I, I thoroughly, strongly, strongly encourage it as a Christmas gift. It's great. Or, or really any holiday gift. But yeah, no, I sell art for Narbonic and Skin Horse and Monster of the Week. Anyway. Yeah, that's the uh, the great advantage of, of doing old time, not old time, but just analog media, actually having something physical there. Yeah. So, yeah, I do have that. I need to use the transform tool way too much to actually <laughs> do traditional media. Oh, that head's too big. <laughs> Quick fix. But on pencil, it's like, oh, I have to redraw the whole thing? No way! Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's not practical for me. Yeah, uh, I do mine in watercolor, so if I really fuck it up, oh my god, I really fuck it up. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't have any, like, hand coloring skills, so, like, I'm really impressed with people who can do watercolor. One of the things I really want to learn. Well, I'm trying to do it anyways. I, I can't guarantee I am any proficient at it, but I'm damn well going to try. No, that's great. So, uh, you don't make your living solely as a comic artist, right? No. I mean, my um, main income is um, as an editor at... Um, a freelance editor for Viz Media. I work on various uh, manga 
titles for them and have for about 10 years now. So I've done a lot of different, handled a lot of different manga over the years. So that's that's my main sort of um, revenue generating job. I also um, teach the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, and I, I write a couple of columns online. The um, yeah, so I, I the comics are not my my primary source of income. Although it's actually gotten better in the last few years since uh, Kickstarter came along, because that has been invaluable for us and getting pre-orders for books and generating interest in them. Um, but most of our income comes from print collections of the books. And, I mean, we do other things, too, but that's the one that makes the most money for us. So, like, having um, having Kickstarter available to help us put out books has been, like, a huge, huge help to us. We put out the last three Skin Horse collections through Kickstarter, and we did um, a Narbonic Omnibus that way, too. So and that's, that's been really good. But it's, um, yeah, basically I have a bunch of different jobs that are all comics related and just, just enough just about enough to, to, to help me to let me survive which is about all you can ask for in this business <laughs> yeah oh heck um let's see <laughs> Um, so you actually recommend Kickstarter to anybody uh, trying to figure out if they have enough of an audience for their book uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to. That's what I initially started using it for because I wanted, I wanted to get pre-orders for Skin Horse Volume Two, and um, Kickstarter makes it really easy to do that. So partly it was just a way to see if I had enough interest uh, in the book to be worth publishing it, and and it was. It had a really great response, and every other Kickstarter we've won has had a great response. Um, it's, you know, it's currently it's currently one of like the biggest sort of. And in a way, it's one of the biggest um, indie comics publishers in the U.S. right now. A lot of cartoonists, especially web cartoonists, they're going through it, which I totally understand. Yeah, Kickstarter seems one of those things that it, I'm surprised it wasn't done earlier. I mean, as soon as there was yeah. like online transactions, it seems weird that no one thought of it sooner. But I guess that's hindsight. But still, it's so popular for so many different mm -hmm. kinds of projects. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's obviously taking off like crazy now. Uh, you had mentioned earlier when we were trying to record earlier, you have a colorist. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, I do. We just um, yeah, we started doing skin horse in color pretty recently, uh, which is great because um, I kind of hate doing I hate coloring. I've hated coloring since since I was in elementary school. Um, I do color work for illustrations, but it's really time consuming. So uh yeah, uh the uh, Poncha Diaz is doing uh the coloring for Skin Horse now. She also designs the print collections. And she is uh we're in a um comics collective together. She's also another editor at Viz. Um if you've read any shoujo manga from Viz, the chances are that you <laughs> no, I've read all the shoujo manga. <laughs> <laughs> she handles a lot of the shoujo man. Yeah. And so she's, um, but she also does the book design for the Skin Horse books. Uh, we're basically, we're in a cartooning collective together, the Couscous Collective. There's about a dozen of us. And we do, like, uh, we put out an anthology every six months and do other projects. So, you know, I knew her and was really familiar with her work. So, you know, Jeff and I asked her if she would, uh, you know, wanted to be our colorist, and she was cool with that. So that's been great. Um, it's pretty fun doing a color strip. Have you done a color book yet? No, that is going to be less fun because on the web, color is free, but not in the real world. Yeah. Um, we might have to start shopping around for different printers when we uh, switch to color. We've been doing the books through Le Bon Fon, which is one of the key, one of the one of your standard comic book publishers, uh, comic book printers. Um, but they are a little pricey, and I don't know if I can afford their color work uh, when it comes to doing the collections of the strips that are in color. So yeah. I'm a little worried about that, but we'll. So if somebody was about to start out into comics, web comics in general, would you give them any advice? Uh, I would just say go for it. I mean, like, one of the things I like about comics is that there's, you know, although I guess it's something other people don't like about comics, but it's one of the things I like. It's, a, it's very democratic. It's a very low barrier to entry. You really just need a piece of paper and a pencil. And for web comics, you need some sort of way of getting it on the internet, which is increasingly easy. 
So, I mean, there's, like, I have no idea how to become, like, a successful web person when there's, like, you know, competition. But, I mean, it's really easy to get started, you know, sharing your work online. And, you know, I personally be in the opinion that the best way to get started in college is to just do it and put your work out. Yeah, I've heard I tales of any... quite a few webcomic artists that have transitioned from that to professional comic book work. Oh, there are tons, yeah. Either professional or at least freelance that I've heard. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I've done, I've done, I've done print work as well. You know, I've done, uh, I've done comics for anthologies. I wrote a couple of stories for Marvel years ago. Um, so you know, I've done some, I've done some, I guess what you would call professional work as well. But I am still primarily a web cartoonist, which is fine because I really like. I like the instant uh, communication with people, and I like having total control over my work. Which is not to say that I don't want to do other things in comics, too, but, you know, I'm very happy doing the web strip. Mm. But, yeah, it was like, um, you know, early in, um, with Narbonic, I was on a site called Modern Tales, um, which was, uh, you know, one of the early webcomic collectives. Uh, actually, the... Uh, Founder and editor Joey Manley died recently, which is very sad. He's a good friend of mine. Aww. But a lot of the people, yeah, I know he's a great, great man. But a lot of the people who worked in, a lot of people who did comics for Modern Tales, you know, they were mo- it was mostly were mostly um, you know new artists at the time. Um, but a lot of the people who worked did stuff for Modern Tales went on to do, well, they went on to do graphic novels or professional work. Also, a lot I noticed a lot of them have gone on to be comics editors. Um, or instructors like um, Tom Hart was in um, in the Modern Tales sites with me early on. We actually collaborated on a comic, uh, which is great because he was an indie cartoonist I was a big fan of. But uh, he runs a, like a cartooning school now. He's like a you know really respected uh, instructor. And a lot of people have gone on to be editors at like Marvel and IDW and stuff. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of like, it's really fun to see how all these different uh, people get started in web comics. And uh, I've been in long enough that I've been able to see, yeah, 13 years worth of uh, people changing and developing, which is pretty fun. Do you consider yourself one of the pioneers of web comics, or you just go, yeah, I just made them? One of the what? Pioneers of web comics. I don't know. I like. I can never tell what my position is in the world of web comics, especially since it's so it's so diversified now, it's so diffuse. Uh, there's so many different subgenres of comics and people who are big fans of some comics might not know about any other web comics. Like, you know people who read, you know, X K C D might never have heard of Homestuck and like vice versa, even among these like big comics. Um when I first got started, there weren't a lot of web comics out there, and so it was possible to read all the web comics or close to all of the web comics, or at least be familiar with everything that's going on. But now it's there's so much, and it's great. Um, but I, you know, there's so many different uh, little worlds and subgenres and communities that I have no idea what like my personal reputation or anyone's reputation is. I actually write the uh, comic column for the Comics Journal, mm-hmm. uh, which is Incredible! Like I feel I'm totally unqualified for trying to actually read web comics because I'm drawing web comics all the time. So I, I feel com- like I'm completely out of touch with um, most of what's going on in the web comics world. But and I think everyone is would be everyone is out of touch with it because there's just so much. So I've been in the habit of just getting people to, like send me links to their comics so I can write reviews and and I'll create the sort of like buffet of of comics and get an impression of like a cross-section of what's going on. But it's just such a diverse world right now. Yeah, that's my my only gripe about drawing up my own webcomic is that I have very little time to read them. And it used to be one of my <laughs> guilty pleasures to uh, just bookmark something and then spend uh, an entire Saturday morning just doing an archive dive, and I, I haven't done that in years now. Except yeah, for comics well, where it's like, t- where they only have like 70 things in there. But like, you know, the we've... I could never come across like questionable content now and read 1300 pages, you know, in a week. Right. There's no way. Yeah. Right. I mean, I also, I used to have an office job, which obviously created a lot more free time for, you know, looking through archives. 
you know, like yeah. that a moment. Now I work at home and I can't. I don't. I feel guilty about taking any time off to do anything else. You have to be pretty. Yeah, you have to be pretty hard on yourself when you're working at home if you want to get anything done. Yeah, I generally actually had to make myself my own office here. It has a door and everything where I can close it and lock it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, I have an office now. I'm very excited. We turned, um, we have a detached garage in the backyard. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we have a detached garage in the backyard, and this year we converted it into an office. So that's my office now. I have this little this little house in the backyard, this little mini house that I go into, and I have it set up as a tiki bar. That's my tiki office. It's excellent. It's very soothing. It's like going into a tropical paradise to work on my comics. Yeah, I, it's funny because I'm I'm actually recently unemployed, and I figured, oh, good, I'll pl have time to play some video games and, you know, go to the gym and do yeah. all sorts of stuff. And all I've been doing is drawing comics and trying to teach myself ZBrush. Good, good. That's what that's as it should be. Yeah. I also don't have time to play video games, which puts me at a disadvantage of creating web comics. Yeah. Well, unless you're doing a comic about video games, of course. Well, see, that's how you make your... That's, that's where the money is, man. But I don't have time... <laughs> yes, I don't have time to do any of that. And also the most advanced video game system I own is a Super Nintendo, which might well, be a little behind the time. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit back there, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, you should like, see my you know, wall of gaming. <laughs> 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 I have I, the original Atari... All the way up until my Xbox 360. I will not get any of the new systems. I wait till they finish working out any bugs they have in the first gen consoles. We've got a Nintendo and a Super Nintendo, and it ends there. So you know, I mean, I you know, video games pretty much, you know, culminated at Zelda: a Link to the Past, as far as I'm concerned. So you know, I'll just you know, play that. <laughs> Uh, yes, the mind suck. Yes. Yeah, I've kind of turned into like a super old tiny nerd now. All my all the nerd stuff I like is old, old manga, old video games, old comic books, even old web comics. Uh, so, do you have a ginormous collection of books yourself? Oh yes, of course. Of course, our house is. Well, I mean, um, my husband and Andrew are the. Um, curator of the, cartoon, of the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. Uh, we actually met when we were both volunteering there years and years ago. And uh, our house is pretty much mostly comics. That's pretty frightening. Um, let's see. Um, well, <laughs> um, let's see. So you said you're, you don't really have big background in uh, art, um, so... No, I, have, I have, like, no artistic background. It's pretty sad. My um, degree is in English, and I, my art skills basically just come from doodling for years and years and years, and uh, I think my art's pretty good now, but if you look at the early Narvonic shirts, you can tell they were done by somebody who has no art training whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm really coming from it from more of a writing and storytelling direction than from a direction. Yeah, it's funny. I, I learned art in school, too, but it was doodling in math class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I did doodle constantly in, like, all my classes. Uh, I'm the only one with a semi-art background. Uh, half my college education was in the art studio, but uh, like I uh, had mentioned before, this is New Mexico, so if it's not fine art, they don't consider it art. Yeah, I am lucky to be in the uh, Bay Area here because it does have a history of cartooning, actually a really good history of comic book art and like really interesting work there and there's a lot of cartoonists here now. Although, you know, we periodically have like an exodus of cartoonists because it's too damn expensive to live here. So like a bunch of people are up in Port a bunch of my friends are up in Portland now. It's just kinda like San Francisco it's cheaper. Um but still it's it's a good community for cartoonists. Like I said, I'm in this um the Couscous Collective, which is a good group and we meet a lot of people who the cartoon art museum, so it is good to have like other cartoonists around to get ideas from and you know get inspired and from. yeah, and rip off. <laughs> this is serious form of flattery. Yep. Uh, um, 
let's see. Do you recommend any uh, comics or anything for anybody that's, you know, just getting into reading web comics? Oh my God, no. I like. Wow, I couldn't even start. Well, it depends on what you like. Cause there's a, like a web comic for everything now. It's it's really awesome. Obviously, yeah, that that is the greatest thing about web comics is that since there's no barrier to entry, anybody can put a comic out about, you know, transgender issues or yeah. shoes yeah, or just anything. You know, like, one of the most successful webcomics, like, in recent years is Unshelved, which is about librarians. And, you know, it's successful because there's a lot of li a lot of librarians and bookstore employees who read webcomics, and they all want to read this one because it's about their industry. And, like, it's, you know, it's basically huge with people who work with books, you know? Um, it's really cool to see that kind of... Um, you know, to see these sort of different niches and interests being filled. So, you know, it really depends on what people like. Um, I don't even know how to begin to recommend comics because there's so much going on. I can, I can say what I personally like, but it's probably different from a lot of, what a lot of people like. I'm a big fan of Jen Manley Lee's um, online graphic novel, Space Box, which is this, like, epic science fiction um, story she's doing. It's really gorgeous. What is the name it's of it? It's a long time to see. Uh, Dicebox. I think it's Dicebox.net. Dicebox. Really good. Okay. Yep. I love Spike's work, Spike Trotman. Uh, she does Templar, Arizona. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is really cool. Jeez, I, I feel like I shouldn't be recommending people because I'll like leave people out and then I'll feel bad afterwards and I'll get guilty. <laughs> uh, just, I mean, no. There's like 40,000 webcomics out there. You could sit there and name them yeah. all day and you'd still leave people out. Oh, yeah. yeah I have a thought. I, I like a lot of the, the ongoing sort of graphic novel style web comics. Um, Bill McConus's is um, Family Man is another one I really like. Um, but, so you're yeah, more into really the like long form versus short form? Yeah. Yeah, even though I draw short form comics myself. Um, even though I draw strips myself, I like long form comics from other people. Obviously, that's because I have the best strip and there's no, there's no topping mine. Clearly. <laughs> That's the only explanation I can think of. So, uh, well, actually, that's not true. There's some other good strips. I like, ah, I couldn't, I can't get into them all. Right. Oh man, uh, I think most people just need to go out there and start googling around and put in web comic or comics in general and just like your favorite subject. Nine times out of ten, you'll at least find a couple out there. That's true. Like I said, I like I have to read this column for the comics journal. It's really I try to pick out ones that I think are exceptionally good. That there's so much, so much interesting stuff going on. And heck, if somebody Google's it and they can't find it, start making yep. it. Yeah. So when you say, um, uh, I'm curious about this. When you say a good comic, um, I tend to break uh -huh. things down into categories of good and entertaining because there's a lot of good comics out there that I'm not interested in reading and there's a lot of entertaining comics out there that maybe not aren't that great but they're just whatever it's a guilty pleasure I like it so uh, what uh -huh. do you look for when you say like a good comic is it a, a total package or at least just whatever one subject matter that yeah, keeps you I interested think, or I, yeah well I think it, I think if it keeps me interested it's probably a good comic even if like you know it might have you know unpolished art or whatever I, I really don't have, you know, now that I think of it, I don't really do guilty pleasures in webcomics. I do guilty pleasures in, like, I, like I, I watch bad movies all the time. That's my guilty pleasure thing. But with uh, comics, I like to see, I like some good, I like good comics. Um, but really, I mean, there's so many ways for a comic to be good that um, I like to say that I like all comics that don't suck. But that's, um, you know, I mean, there's plenty, in webcomics especially, there's, like, Plenty of comics that uh, you know really fun. They're well written, but you know, not spectacularly well drawn, and that's fine with me. In fact, um, I really like that there's a focus on on writing and creativity um, rather than visual polish with a lot of comics. Also, all the comics I just listed as my favorites all have fantastic visual polish. So, you know, I'm I'm lying about everything I say basically. Yeah, it's funny because I'm I'm the same way. Where I consider myself primarily an artist. Because I guess that takes the most of my time, but I've I've recently considered that the writing is generally the most important part of a comic. Because you know I can read a comic that's boring that has 
really good art, but it has to have fantastic art for me to keep coming back mm-hmm. to it. But if it has writing that's even remotely competent and there's, there's a subject matter that I care about or, or interesting characters or funny, it doesn't matter what the art looks like. Yeah, I wouldn't read. I mean, I would be very unlikely to read a comic that was well drawn and didn't have a good story. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, ideally, ideally a great cartoonist is primarily a storyteller in both the writing and the drawing service visual storytelling. Comics are difficult. You know, it's actually a pretty difficult art to master. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I've been uh, taking writing classes online here just to try to up my writing skills because I know they they are the ones I more lack in than my art skills. Mm, I'm the I'm the opposite. I don't need to work on my art. But I think I think a good comic will be able to carry over even with poor art and the and the good story. And then you can always improve your art over time. Yeah, again, a good story can carry bad artwork much more easily than bad, than good artwork can carry a bad story. <clears throat> Battle <Comic> chasers. <clears throat> yeah, a comic would have to be now, really see, spectacular looking for me to read it. It's yeah, Battle Chasers is one of those ones where I didn't care about the characters or the story, but the art was so good. Yes. I, I mean, because no uh, it's, it's, uh, it was a comic. It was a very brief comic. only ran for like 12 issues, but uh, it was drawn by a guy named Joe Madureira, who... Oh, uh, Joe Madureira. Yeah. Yeah, he, he did, uh, he did canny X-Men and a bunch of... Yeah, but he's, he's... I would consider him technically a nearly perfect comic artist, but... Like just technically, his actual rendering skill, but it, it, nothing that he draws has, seems to have much character. Like it's all scally-faced, you know, muscle-bound people. And it, it yeah. there was a couple times where there was a joke or two in like Battle Chasers, and it didn't really seem to play with me because I was like, this art is too good for it to be funny. Yeah. It, which is a weird way to think, but it, it was the it, art was overpowering everything else. It, it was overpowering, and it was very pinup. Yeah, I, I, remember this fun ba- I do remember Battle Chasers having this amazing cover that managed to get like an ass, boob, and crotch shot in like the same figure, which is really impressive. Yes. Yes, it was it was it was, it was kind of constant with it too. As much as I enjoyed the look of it, it didn't convey the story, and the writing on it was not. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it only yeah, ran for about, what, about a dozen issues at that? No, it, it only ran for a dozen issues because Joe Madura became a millionaire drawing it and doing also his work on Kenny X-Men and decided, you know what, I'd rather play video games for a few years. And then he eventually uh, went and founded some uh, video game company. He he was the uh, concept artist behind Darksiders, hmm. which you can almost tell immediately from looking at it, but... Um, yeah, it wasn't that it wasn't popular. It was just that he was like, you know what, I don't need to draw this. On second thought, that should be an inspiration for us all. Just like draw enough pinup art that you can quit and like go start some ridiculous video game company. You know, there was one back the back in the '90s when there was like the big Image Comics boom, which I don't know how old you guys are, yeah. but um, oh that yeah, was, that was when. That was when people would. That was when there were fans who would just buy every single comic that came out of Image because obviously they were all going to be worth a million dollars in 20 years and pay for everyone's college tuition. Uh, but um, yeah, there was at least one artist who drew exactly one issue of. They like you know, he's done. You know, he's, he's what, got uh, what he, he got. What he came for. You you dropped out there for a second. What what uh, comic was it? Um, I don't. I'm not going to say which comic it was, but there was one issue of it. Exactly one issue. Uh, issue one made like a million bucks, and the artist was like, well, I got a million oh, bucks, and no further read to draw. Yes, and he's yeah. gone. That was it. That might be the first thought that the, the comic industry had gotten a little wonky. Yeah. Well, that was when they were also doing those super gimmicky ones, too, like the artists put their blood in the ink at the printers. Yeah. Yes, and... that happened. That totally happened. Oh my god. I couldn't believe they were doing that. I was like, I'm not buying that issue. I do not want the AIDS or something. I don't know. I will not read the comic because I do not want the AIDS. Yeah, well, that was also when they did every issue was holofoil covers and all that crazy garbage. 
truly an amazing de decade. I still have some of those in my box. Is plural. <laughs> hey, it was like with the late eighties, early nineties there. Yeah. Yeah. I I bought just about everything I could because well I was a stupid teenager. Well, that's definitely an example of um, art over writing, because mm -hmm. very few of those comics had decent stories or characters in them. Um, I mean, Spawn arguably was okay, but most of the other comics were, it was a bunch of artists getting sick of working with Marvel and DC and decided, you know what, we can write our own stories. Yeah, that's what it was initially. Every, all the popular artists at Marvel were basically jumping shit for their own company. Yeah. That was an interesting time. Well, they're, they're Which is, a lot of interesting stuff I mean, I can't blame them for it because it they, they went from everything that they made, you know, being owned by Marvel to... Exactly. Um, like being, it all being creator owned, which is, I mean, Image is actually an awesome company now. Um, they've diversified yeah, tremendously. And I know, I think like Scott Kurtz, who does PVP, up. published quite a few of his yeah. books through them. Yeah, the PVP comic is through Image. Uh, yeah, it was, um, we did a, at the Cartoon Art Museum, we did like an Image, what was it, a 10-year retrospective, maybe? 20 year. We did a 20-year retrospective of Image, and there's actually a lot of great art in there. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff over the years. Okay, so if somebody is just starting out today yeah. with the, with making a comic, so, okay, so you got your pen, you got your paper. Yes. Uh, yeah. What do you recommend, like maybe a good how-to book or... Uh... Well, you should also have a ruler for drawing panel borders. Right. But, you know, okay, there's actually, I mean, there's so many good books on comics now. You know, it's, it's, it's an exciting time. I mean, obviously, I recommend Scott McCloud's book. Uh, he's my hero. Um, understanding comics, reinventing comics, and making comics. Uh, his whole trilogy is really helpful. Right. Um, for the whole comics. Uh, Will Eisner's books are really good. Um, he's another of the, uh, the classic experts in the field. Uh, graphic storytelling and comics and sequential art are both really good. Uh, Jessica... Jessica Abel and Matt Madden have been doing some great um, yes. comic construction. Yeah, the I, drawing I, I words, just, writing yeah. pictures. Yeah, I just picked that up a little while back. I sat there going, oh, I didn't know that right. part. Oh, my God. Yeah, yes, it is. I mean, their work is aimed primarily at instructors, so it's pretty dense. Um, maybe a little advanced for people who are just starting out drawing. But I find it, I mean, there's obviously a lot of really interesting, helpful stuff in there. They've written a lot yeah. of interesting stuff about just making comics. Yeah, I think my biggest challenge going from, you know, primarily just doing pinup art, which I did before I did the comic, to doing a comic was, you know, and I'm still very much learning it, is the whole sequential part of it. Like, how do you cut down what's in your head into um, something that makes sense to someone else reading it? Um, I and I guess... I yeah, I yeah, and I'm not sure what the best thing. resource is for learning that. <laughs> The Cloud books are great, and Eisner's books are great for that, and, and um, Jessica and Matt's books. Um, also, I found it really useful to study movie film theory, too, because there's a lot of a lot of the same uh, skills going to telling a story visually through film and telling a story visually through comics. It's a little different, but um, you, you can learn a lot of the same, uh, a lot of valuable things by learning how like, directors like Eisenstein experimented with how to put images together to tell a story. I'm also kind of a film geek. So I read up a lot on film, on film studies. So I studied, you know, so that's that's useful too. But yeah, I mean, comics are like at their very basic about telling a story in pictures, and that can be a surprisingly hard uh, skill to learn. I really, um, I've taught, I taught a class on writing comics at the Academy of Art a few years ago, and um, I really. It was all people who wanted, it was mostly students who primarily wanted to be writers and not artists, but I insisted that they draw out thumbnails for everything they were writing because I wanted them to think visually, even when they were writing dialogue. And I tried really hard to get them to uh, think in terms of pictures and in terms of moving from one picture to the next to tell the story and not rely on, on the writing. Well, like I took some uh, storyboarding classes there in uh, college. Oh, they too. actually offered some... Uh, one with my advertising degree. And oh, that's good. That's yeah, good too. 
Yeah, that was really awesome. It got me to uh, visually think more about camera angles and things like that, you know, so you can actually tell when a movie's being badly made now, too, yeah. so mm -hmm. that ruined me for movies. <laughs> yeah. It ruins you, but it's good for you. <laughs> no, it, it, makes, it, makes, it, it gives you critical reasoning skills. Uh, yes, the critical reasoning skills, the skills of reasoning that I don't use now, other than for comics. <laughs> Yay, your economy! Ah, uh, hell's bells. Alright, let's see. Well, we're coming up on uh, just a little over the half hour mark here, guys. Um, do you have anything else you want to add in there for uh, anybody starting out? Do you recommend them getting a collective right away? It's free. I mean, I feel kind of sick. I feel like um, when I got started in comics, like, again, which is way back in 2000, uh, there were a lot of people getting collectives coming up, and there were, there, was, um, there were a lot of different groups of people helping each other out in World Comics. Uh, there was a lot of camaraderie going around. I mean, Modern Tales is just a great community to be part of. Everyone was really helpful to each other and um, supportive. And one of the other uh, Modern Tales sites, uh, girl o matic which is for, like, sort of female reader-centered comics, is, like, they were even chummy. I really like being part of the girl o matic group. And now I, I don't know. There's, like, um, I feel like it's... Um, Maybe we need more collectives. I feel like we need like more communication and cooperation between uh, cartoonists online, uh, especially since there's a lot of intellectual property issues that we're facing nowadays. Um, now that web comics are periodically lucrative, um, I would like to see. I know there are collectives out there. There are groups. There are groups that are still working together. I uh, like the Potco, but I, I would like to see I'd like to see more cooperation among web cartoonists. I think it would be good if like if they talk to each other and like support newcomers a lot more than they do. Oh, that's uh, why so many forums still work pretty well. Is because a lot of people still do a lot of base communication there, at least. Uh, Dave, I know you've got a pretty active forum on your website. Does anybody ask you fairly frequently about, uh, like, art advice or comics advice? Um, you know, I haven't really gotten a lot of that. Mostly it's just um, talk about the comic um, and, you know, what's going on because it's, you know, like any, any decent community of nerds, you get um, people who, who, you know, I, I had a comic with a railgun in it and uh, everybody started talking physics. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean I get the occasional I get the occasional question about like my own process, which I'm happy to answer, and I probably should make like a, a an FAQ about it. Um, but yeah, I uh, I I belong to a, a a collective of well not a collective a uh, a Facebook page, which is almost the only thing I use Facebook for, but it's all web comic artists, and they you know mm, oh yeah. I have a color book I need to print. Anybody have a good recommendation or what's your best uh, way for you know, whatever, doing new readers or drawing backgrounds or whatever. So it's it's just artists basically pretty much staying on topic and talking with each other, which is pretty nice. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, a problem sometimes I've, doing interviews. We kind of run out of Questions. <laughs> okay, so um, somebody starting out, they've got their pen, their paper, their ruler. They got a couple of books on how to do it. Um, digital wise, uh, I would recommend at least having Photoshop and a decent scanner. To, <laughs> yeah, that's true. To get that that ball rolling, because there you got to have a way to get it up on the uh, made it make it digital and then get it get it up on the internet. Um, you can actually get a fairly decent computer system for just, you know, four or five hundred dollars anymore. Uh, just as long as you don't dick around too much on, you know, unsafe websites or anything. Uh, the computer power is not a problem anymore. I mean, a basic netbook 
Well, I mean, yeah. it, it, there's there's very little that you're doing in a comic that takes so much power. As long as you have maybe four gigs of RAM, that's kind of the only requirement you need. I mean, I'm pretty low tech at first. I'm, I'm a pretty low tech web cartoonist. Uh, when I was, geez, when I first started out, I didn't even have Photoshop. I was editing the images on MS Paint, which is terrifying. Oh. But uh, yeah, Photoshop is good, and it's obviously a good scanner. It's probably necessary for drawing things on paper. Uh, but you know, it's I, I, I it's, I'm not really tech oriented when it comes to this, like uh, doing the web comics. I keep things pretty simple. I finally upgraded to having like a WordPress-based site for Skin Horror, but actually, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah, you you got to be a little bit on the tech savvy side in order to uh, uh, maintain your own websites. Uh, I do recommend if somebody's starting out and they have absolutely zero experience in uh, web design or anything web related, either taking uh -huh. a class on it or uh, hiring somebody to do it for you, if anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I have someone. Um, I have someone managing my website now because I've been having a lot of technical problems with it that are beyond my uh, beyond tech person now. Yeah, that's pretty handy. But I mean, there's a lot of web yeah, comics well, out there that run on you know it's it's WordPress plus Comic Press and that's it. And you can tell they didn't even spend any time like customizing the site as far as graphics go, it's just like that bare bones installation, but it works. You know, if you're just, if all you're interested yeah. in is getting a comic out there, that sometimes that's enough. And then you can wait till, you know, you have. Yeah, I'm personally not a fan of doing a lot of elaborate web design. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a pretty clean design on Skin Horse. It's got what I need on it. I, an Arbonic site, which is still up, it's still in HTML and like it works. I have not changed it in 13 years. It's, it's sitting there. It looks fine. It works. You can read comics through it. Uh, you know, I, I, try to, I like to keep things pretty simple. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, why don't you have any uh, advertising up on your website? Oh, I do. Oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty unobtrusive, though. I have a banner. I do wonderful ads. I have a banner ad um, on the site. So I have banners advertising. Um, my own work and my own books and like stuff from the Couscous store. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm, I, I, I don't have a lot of targeted advertising. It's not really, it's not really a site that makes a lot of, the site does not make a lot of money through advertising. Like I said, my primary uh, revenue stream is uh, print collections of the books and occasionally other merchandise. Um, it really doesn't have such a huge readership that, uh, generates a whole lot of advertising money. I mean, does it make enough to, like, basically pay for the site, though? Um, yeah, because, like, the site's pretty cheap. I mean, websites are pretty cheap to run now. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the site, I mean, the comic makes, the comic makes plenty of money, but it makes us money through book sales rather than through on-site advertising. So more merchandise than anything else? Yes. Yeah, I haven't quite gotten to that point yet because for some reason I decided my first book would be similar to a, a, an issue of Empowered, which if you're familiar with that is a, you know, okay, like 200, yeah. you like, 200 page. You like uh, cheesecake artist, my friend. Oh, yeah. That <laughs> is an amazing artist. That is a oh, guy yeah. I would just read his comics for his art. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. His, his, I, learned, I learned everything I know about, like, making stuff look shiny <laughs> for reading his <laughs> old dirty pair. <laughs> Adam Warren, I think the great secret of Adam Warren is that he could actually be the greatest cartoonist in the world if he wanted to, but he actually would rather just draw cheesecake art, which is totally fine with me. Yeah. It's funny, if you follow him on Twitter, he'll eventually, every once in a while, like once or twice a month, he'll get on some rant about, you know, hand lettering or doing sound effects and just, uh, he's obviously reading something that he doesn't appreciate. Yeah. He doesn't name, he doesn't call it any names, but he's like, here's why this is bad. And it's, 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 it's funny, but also kind of educational if you, if you're actually paying attention to it. Yeah. He's good. He was like, he was crazy. He started out crazy young too. He's like a real prodigy. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Considering when I was, God, I was in uh, high school. God, I think I was in high uh -huh. school. Yeah, when yeah. when I was reading his Dirty Pair stuff. And, I mean, you're looking at yeah, him now. He's, he's not like he's 70. Yeah. yeah. No, he's still a young guy. 
Yeah, some guys, yeah, some people just, like, start out really young. Kyle Baker was, like, 18 when he started growing professionally, and he's still already ridiculously good. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, well, that, that, that leads into the advice that I always give, which is if you want to do a webcomic, start doing a webcomic. Like, don't don't wait for some great, you know, trinity of events or whatever, some, you know, um, something to prompt you to start doing it. Like, if you want to start doing it, just start doing it. Because I sat I down for 10 years going, I should do a webcomic. And eventually, it, eventually I did, but geez. Uh, a lot of people like the. There are a lot of people who like the idea of being an artist more than they like actually making art. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it's that idea that takes about ten thousand hours of like hardcore practice to be good at something. I mean, it takes about ten years before you can really master. And I think that, like for comics, it's especially true. Obviously, there's some people who are there's a small number of cartoonists who are total prodigies and started really young, but. A lot of the best cartoonists like didn't get to be really great till they were in their thirties or forties or later. Like Jack Kirby wasn't like didn't like really take off until you know, he was in his forties. Carl yeah. Barks didn't start doing the Donald Duck comics until late in his career. It takes a long time to master comics. Yeah, and it's it's doing a webcomic makes me appreciate <clears throat> even the most meager comic book effort. <laughs> The most meager webcomic out there that has just no sense of perspective and they don't know their proportions, but they're doing it. And I'm like, that's uh-huh. more than most people are doing, and I respect that. It is. It is. At least they're trying. I mean, they're drawing something. They're yeah. putting something out there in the world. Definitely. Doing is better than not. All right, guys, let's go ahead and just wrap this up for today, I think. What do y'all think? I think that's fine. Well, thank you for uh, talking with us, Shannon, and again, I apologize about all the fuck-ups today. Of course, that's fine. Ah, uh, yes, world, I love you too so much, especially when you fuck with my software. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you very much for stopping on by. Um and we will stay in touch. You are always welcome to come and join us again. Uh, we've got some other interviews uh, lined up here pretty quick. Uh, Art Baltazar I've got coming up. Should be here in a couple more weeks. So, um, all right, guys. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see oh, you next month. Okay, bye. Bye.